So take a look at this question. Here they are saying the conversion of atomic hydrogen into ordinary hydrogen is what, right? So basically here, as you can see the options, they are talking about the nature of this change, right? Is it going to be an exothermic change? Is it going to be an endothermic change? Is it going to be a nuclear change or a photochemical change? Basically, you know, majorly we are talking about these four changes here. Okay, so now let's, you know, dig a little deeper. Let's see what exactly we need to do here. So uh, we are talking about atomic hydrogen, atomic hydrogen being converted into ordinary hydrogen. What is ordinary hydrogen? Nothing but your H2, right? Which is your molecular hydrogen. So here, what we can do is we can uh, take a look at it. So see, initially you have this, which is an atom. And of course, two such hydrogen atoms will have to combine to give you a molecule. Right? So in molecule, what is the first thing? You have bonding, right? Because of bonding, what happens is your system is becoming more stable. There's some amount of energy released from these, your atomic hydrogens, right? Atomic hydrogens, which, which had very high energy, they have combined together to form a molecule and the energy in the process is lowered, which means energy is released. So you get H2 plus some energy right or i can say that the delta h for this process is negative or that i am talking about an exothermic change right this is what i am talking about here so let's see let's take a look at the next slide uh what do we have here okay so our options are back and which option is correct definitely option a which means option a exothermic change is going to be the right answer to this question Okay, so here they're asking us compound which has the highest thermal stability is going to be what? Let's take a look at our options. So you have ASH3, PH3, NH3, SBH3. What are these? So these are hydrides of group 15 elements. So we are talking about the thermal stability of group 15 elements. Okay. So first thing we need to know is that we are talking about a P block hydride, right? A set of P block hydrides, which means these are going to be covalent in nature. So what we need to address here is the fact uh, about how effective is the overlap, right? Okay, so let's take a look. So here we are talking about group 15 elements. So you have nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, and then you have bismuth. Correct? This is how your group 15 looks like. Now, as you go down the group, what happens? As you go down the group, size increases, right? Size increases and you are talking about hydride, which means, which means the effective overlap will be higher when you have a smaller size, okay? So here, if you have, uh, you know, size increasing as you go down the group, I can say that the effective overlap will be decreasing as we go down the group because of which what happens is the thermal stability the thermal stability will decrease as we go down the group okay so which one is going to be the most stable the one with the smallest size which one has the smallest size nitrogen of course so which of these is going to be the most thermally stable nh3 right so ammonia or nh3 is going to have the highest thermal stability so yes, let's come back to our options. We can see ammonia in option C, which means option C, NH3 is going to be the right answer to this question. All right, so in this question, they're saying that a vessel contains H2 and O2 in the molar ratio of eight is to one. This mixture of gases is allowed to diffuse through a hole. Find the ratio of the composition of H2 to that of O2 coming out through the hole, right? And these are your options, okay? These are your options that you need to keep in mind. So now, first of all, very, very important thing. What is the law we are going to use? Without knowing the law, you can't proceed with this question. So, see, we are talking about effusion of gases or diffusion of gases. So here, what it is that we are talking about is basically Graham's law. You need to know that we are talking about Graham's law. Okay, cool. So let me write things down. So what do we know? We know that rate is directly proportional to 1 by root m this much we know okay but here you have to use the modified form of graham's law which basically tells you this okay so this is the ratio that we'll be using rate is directly proportional to n by root m okay and once you have this then you can say that rate of what was it hydrogen to oxygen right so rate of hydrogen divided by rate of oxygen is going to be equal to number of moles of hydrogen by number of moles of oxygen okay multiplied by multiplied by under root of molar mass of oxygen divided by molar mass of 
hydrogen okay o2 h2 everywhere just to consolidate i have written it like this so yes this is what you need to know what has the question provided you with the question has provided you with the molar ratio of nitro sorry of hydrogen and oxygen in the mixture so number of moles of hydrogen is to number of moles of oxygen in the mixture is given to you as 8 is to 1 so this ratio here will become 8 okay so rate of hydrogen by rate of oxygen rate of diffusion of hydrogen by rate of diffusion of oxygen when i take this ratio i get 8 into under root of what what is the molar mass of oxygen molar mass of o2 gas is going to be 32 gram per mole so 32 here divided by molar mass of hydrogen gas so h2 so you have 2 gram per mole so this will become 16 correct so square root of 16 is going to be 4 so you have 8 into 4 32 here right so this is the rate of hydrogen versus the rate of oxygen what exactly is rate rate is nothing but your volume if used per unit time or volume if used div divided by the time that has lapsed okay here we are talking about the effusion in the same amount of time so which means volume of hydrogen effused divided by volume of oxygen effused is going to be 32 is to 1 yes this is the ratio that we were required to find they asked us to find one second uh, okay they asked us to find what is going to be uh, find the ratio of composition right ratio of composition is very well the ratio of volumes why because by gas laws we know that p is directly proportional to n so yes here the ratio that we are looking for number of moles of h2 diffusing by number of moles of o2 diffusing this is going to be equal to 32 is to 1 right so 32 is to 1 is here in option b which means option b 32 is to 1 is going to be the right answer to this question all right so here they're asking us which of the following is a polar compound okay let's take a look at the options so option a is c2h6 so this is nothing but ethane then you have ccl4 carbon tetrachloride then you have hcl okay so hydrogen chloride then you have ch4 which is methane okay so out of these four molecules we need to take uh, we need to be able to uh, figure out which of these is polar in nature so what do we know we know that if for a certain molecule if i can say if i can say that the mu net mu net is not equal to zero then it is going to be polar in nature okay so that is the condition i need so let's take a look at the molecule so first molecule you have is c2h6 correct so i'm going to write c2h6 here so what is this ethane okay so in case of ethane the structure that you're looking at is going to be this right now fundamentally fundamentally what you need to understand is that carbon and hydrogen have a very very low electronegativity difference and you have one carbon carbon bond so overall for this molecule whatever dipole moment you get because this is going to be symmetrical your mu net is going to cancel out you will get mu net is equal to zero this is a vector calculation remember i'm not diving into this too much because we've studied this way back in chemical bonding right so here you know that this is a non-polar molecule here your mu net is equal to zero then you have ccl4 okay so in case of ccl4 what is the molecule that we're looking at so you have a tetrahedral structure like this okay all right so here what you have you have a carbon chlorine bond now you know chlorine is definitely more electronegative so chlorine is going to pull the one pair of electrons towards it like this okay and this is going to be the case for all the four bonds so yes this is how your individual bond moments are going to be now when you sum it up when you do the vector addition when you take the bond angle and do the vector addition what you will see is that your net dipole moment is going to be equal to zero so here also you have mu net is equal to zero okay important idea ccl4 has polar bonds but the molecule overall is going to be non-polar okay cool next we have hcl hydrogen chloride okay so here what happens is you have a bond between hydrogen and chlorine chlorine is definitely more electronegative it is pulling the bond pair of electrons towards itself because of this can i say it is a polar molecule yes definitely you have just one bond moment and that bond moment is going to be your net dipole moment and that bond moment is not equal to zero which means here your mu net is going to be not equal to zero 
then you have CH4. This is very, very similar to CCl4. Again, you have a carbon-hydrogen bond, which is going to have very low electronegativity difference. So no matter which direction the bond moment is in, it is all going to get cancelled out because of the vector addition. Okay, so yes, this is what you need to know. Here you have mu net is equal to zero okay this is what we get now let's check we have one place where mu net is not equal to zero that is an option c which means option c at cl hydrogen chloride is going to be the right answer to this question okay so here they're asking us which of the following will show aromatic behavior big big star mark in front of this question it's a really important question in almost every single competitive exam every single year you are going to see such a question right aromaticity is one of the favorite topics of all you know examiners throughout okay now let's see so you have options a b c and d and before you actually pinpoint which one will show aromatic behavior and which one will not show aromatic behavior, you need to understand what are the rules of aromaticity. So let's very quickly go through all the rules. Okay, so what are the rules for aromaticity? We are here, we are talking about Huckel's rules of aromaticity, right? So first is that your molecule needs to be planar. Second is it needs to have conjugation. Okay, you need to have conjugation and the third thing is that within the ring you need to have 4n plus 2 pi electrons for me to call it aromatic right and 4n pi electrons for me to call it anti-aromatic right and if the molecule is failing any of these three rules then it is going to be non-aromatic okay that is if you see that it's not a planar molecule or if it doesn't have conjugation then you can simply say that it is a non-aromatic molecule okay very very important rules that we apply to what to that we apply to cyclic compounds okay come on now let's take a look at our compounds and see which of these agree with Huckel's rules and which of these is going to be the right answer to this question so here we have our options again so option a you can see that here in option a what we are lacking is conjugation so due to the lack of conjugation this molecule is not going to qualify so this is going to be a non-aromatic molecule let me go ahead and write that so this is a non-aromatic molecule very important what do we have next? Option B is benzene. Now, without even thinking too much, we know benzene is one of the first examples that comes to our mind when we think of aromatic nature. So, this is planar. This has conjugation. This has 4n plus 2. That is, this has 4n. That is, n is equal to 1. So, you have 6 electrons, 6 pi electrons in the ring, which means, yes, this is aromatic. This is definitely right. Okay. So, this is correct. Then you have option C where you have what? You have a cyclohexane with a double bond. Okay, now, yes, this has, uh, this is planar. Okay, but this does not have conjugation because of which, again, we have to talk about this as a non-aromatic compound. Option D, again, lack of conjugation because of which this also becomes non-aromatic so when we talk about aromatic nature there's just one molecule which is showing aromaticity that is nothing but option b so option b is going to be the right answer to this question